from when I was a child. What I wanted was to be a gentleman. And life just crept up on me. One day preceding the next, not happy, not unhappy. It was small wonder I didn't notice. The concept wasn't a remake of Ikiru set in England or, you know, post-war London. It was a remake of Ikiru with Bill Nye in, in the main part. I mean, that, that was the idea that I pitched to Stephen Woolley. It was a wonderful script, and he, wasn't, he was reluctant. Mr Ishiguro was reluctant to write the screenplay because he said, I'm a novelist, you know, I don't really do that. But Stephen uh, persisted, so he did. And um, it was a great script. And I'm interested, I don't know whether I first read it, but I'm interested in that kind of um, almost comic degree of restraint that's involved in um, British or English behavior of that period. I mean, it still persists and I'm sure it's not peculiar. They call it Englishness, but it's, I'm sure in every culture they have characters like Mr. Williams. But I'm fascinated by it and I kind of love it. I kind of admire it. I think, you know, and, and I also th find it funny, the fact that you're basically not allowed to express anything at all, really, apart from, you know, complain about the weather or something. Um, and there's a kind of heroism in there somehow. The results have come back. It's never easy, this. Quite. When I was growing up in, in Surrey, you know, I, I travelled every morning to school on the same train line as the, as the commuters from Guildford going into Waterloo. And so I was very familiar with, with all these bowler-hatted gents, you know, going into the city. Uh, and also, you know, I, I arrived in Britain at, a, at the age of five in 1960, and, and so I'm old enough to have remembered that generation that kind of disappeared in the 60s of, of, of English people who still th were, thought they had to behave in, the, in, a, in a certain kind of British manner that was probably more pre-war, pre you know. But I still remember, you know, a lot of my friends' parents were you know, they're rather stiff, whether they're male or female, you know, and, and they, yeah, they're, they're behaving in that kind of way. And I have a fascination for that, for, for, for that kind of England. But it's not just a historical fascination. You see, for a long time, for me, you know, that kind of Englishness is a kind of a metaphor for something that is universal in human beings. You know, I, I think it's more than just how a bunch of English people behaved. You know, it, it's, I think everybody has a little bit of this Englishness in them. The structure of the original film is kind of famous, you know, it has this famous plot turn, and I think that that was something that you just, if you didn't do it, it would feel like you sort of didn't, uh, you know, you weren't celebrating the essence of Ikaru. Uh, so we wanted to do, the, to do those things as well. Um, and Ishiguru was brilliant at um, taking, like ha having the same conversations, having the characters have the same conversations and revelations, but putting them in context that just felt incredibly English and appropriate for, for this setting. Um, I think that's kind of what he brought to it. He sort of decoded the Japanese film in a way that made it, you know, as, a, as an interesting comparison, companion piece to the original. Um, but we, he and I both definitely, you know, there was this real sense of, we're not making a remake, we're, we're, we're transposing a story, we're taking inspiration from a story, but we have to do things for ourselves. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, Mr. Williams. In a way, it kind of, by saying, you know, Bill Nye, it kind of, the Englishness and whatever took care of itself. It, it was almost like a shorthand for that. So everything I wrote, I mean, every line, not just every line, but every time I imagined, you know, how Williams would, would look at, you know, look across the room or look down and look away, I imagined how Bill would do it, yeah. And so everything, stage direction, everything was, was built around how it would look when Bill Nye was doing it. That's a silly nickname. I don't think I'll tell you. Oh, no, no, you've come this far. You have to tell me. Mr. Zombie. Mr. what? A sort of dead, but not dead. Mr. Zombie. He's institutionalized in grief because he lost his wife very early on in their marriage when she was young, a young woman. And he's, and, and I feel that he's formed a cult of one and that everything, everything else in his life, his whole experience and every day, everything has formed around that, that grief. Um, and he sort of, uh, he deals with the world. He speaks from 
uh, you know, he sort of, he communicates from that pain. Everything's within that context, you know. It's, uh, before you get to, oh, I'm about to die, um, he's, uh, he's been in that cult for a couple of decades. I really approached Bill from the very beginning, kind of being very clear about what I wanted. You know, I, I sort of, I, I kept sort of re reiterating to Bill that this is, you know, we meet a man who's meant to be sort of like living but dead, um, and what that would mean in terms of energy, and that would that would mean in terms of movement. And Bill does think, you know, he always says that when he acts on stage that he dances on stage, um, and so I said to him like, you know, it's it's going to be still and stiff, and and then that, you know, in conversations with Bill, he then started talking about his voice, and then we, you know, decided that he would lower the register of his voice, and it would become something very slight. Um, and so there were all these, again, that, you know, those hours spent, I'd go to Bill's house every Sunday and we'd have brunch and he would always be in a suit. And we would just sit on his couch and we would, you know, I would sort of move around the script a lot. And that, that was how we sort of started designing Williams. Um, and then and then making decisions. And uh, it's, you know, Bill's a process person. I'm a process person. We, and I, I find it nerve wracking to arrive at the set and not have a sense of, of, of the register of things. Um, so that made this uh, process incredibly joyful. I did feel that it was important that there, you know, that there was a younger generation person who was in danger of becoming, in his, in, in his turn, you know, somebody rather like Mr. Williams, you know, just, just bowed down by the sheer weight of bureaucracy and not, not knowing where his contribution was going. Um, but who who could perhaps transcend that, you know, um, because he has a memory of this older man who went through the whole, whole thing. So I wanted him to be the recipient of of some spark of inspiration about how you, how you can even even with such a modest and limited life, you can actually make something of it, you know. So I wanted I wanted him I wanted a young person who who could be that who we could identify with all the way through. Don't worry, old chap. This time of morning. It's a kind of rule, not too much fun and laughter, rather like church. London's definitely changed, of course. Um, so we chose our moments, you know, we were shooting in County Hall. We could run out, literally like, like film school style, we could run out onto the South Bank with a camera and shoot two actors looking at Big Ben. But we had to, you know, retouch Big Ben in post because that one time you want to shoot Big Ben, it's covered in scaffolding. Uh, so we shot Big Ben with knowing that I'd have to redo it um, and, and dirty it up and make it look period. and. Uh, we knew that there was this little slice of Waterloo Station that I could put a camera on and uh, close that down for a couple of hours. And, and so we just, I, we, like all the photography that I would see, I would sort of steal bits. Um, and then I interestingly sort of went in the in post, I kind of went a step further and I was like, well, I could actually integrate archival footage into this film and, you know, Piccadilly Circus. And so it became very intertextual in the end. Oscar, well, time to live a little if you chose to. To be involved in this film with these people with this part and have an opportunity as you say to to you know i don't know about say you know to demonstrate something about the human ex existence and about the big themes that you know they are the biggest themes like death doesn't come much bigger and procrastination which is huge it's the corrosive element in our lives you know to be involved in all of that and to and to then hear a report, you know, because I don't watch anything I'm in, so I, you know, I, it's all hearsay, you know, which is fine with me, you know, which is ideal for me. Um, but to have it apparently being appreciated in the way it is, it's absolutely, you know, I feel it, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, it, uh, I, I, I'm profoundly grateful for that opportunity. It means a great deal to me. I don't want to be mistaken for anybody who is, uh, you know, being glib about it or anything of that kind. I'm very, 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 very proud to be a part of all of this. And I think that the film is, you know, an important film and an important story. And I hope that lots and lots of people go and see it. Mr. Williams, are you all right? Never better. It does seem to me that he's changed. Yes. He has decided to grasp life, and we have to admire him for it. You know, I remember what it's like to be alive.